All right, you ready to kick this sucker off? I'm looking at you, Nick. Oh. <laughs> Jacob sure could give two shits. <laughs> From fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, and real therapists. You can submit your questions anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. We need to apologize for last episode. That episode was so terrible, Trump wants to use it as a corona update. Hello! Oh, and yes. you write good jokes. I am so good. All right. <laughs> Broadcasting from the churn, that guy's Dr. Jim Jobin. I'm Nick Tangeman. It's time for some pot therapy. So now uh, you and Matt Donnelly are really good at ripping off RJ material. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, hello, listeners. We're excited to present a guest today. Uh, many of you guys who are in the ICS community and we're in... Uh, Jacob's robe time twitch a couple of weeks back from when you're hearing this. Uh, you got to see uh, RJ join the conversation, and he was drunk enough to agree to come on the show. Thanks, RJ. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Excited to have him here with us. And, Not uh, regretting any of this None whatsoever. of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the things we do with whiskey. So, And he brought dessert. He did. Bread oh, pudding. Yeah, bread oh. pudding, man. Yeah. That was amazing. So this is really how good. you're you're filling the coronavirus hours, huh? It's just cooking and what do you do all day, man? Oh how do you God. fill the time? Every I do everything. Like uh, when I had my when I got injured at work uh, three four years ago, I uh, started doing leather crafts again, which I had done oh, when cool. I was a kid in 4-H. Yeah. And uh, a friend from the show had given me probably eighty pounds of. Leather from an old thirty-year-old butt-worn leather couch. Okay, yeah. so I had all this leather, so I was like, "I'm going to start working on leather crafts." Well, now with the Corona thing, I'm doing more leather work and oh, making cool. wallets and satchels and and bears. Oh my, um, <laughs> leather bears don't get enough press. No, nope, they do in San Francisco, which is where I'm from. So, uh, but I'm also doing stuff. I mean, we're doing what everybody's doing, trying to stay sane. Yeah. Doing stuff around the house. I built some Roman shades. I, oh, cool. I as I was. Getting prepped for my leather work, I needed. I realized I needed a small table to store my stuff on because every time I I hit the hammer on my big table to punch a leather, uh, everything just oh, went everywhere. Yeah, jingle so I went out and took me an hour and I built a small little table to sit next to it to put all my tools on. <laughs> like you have to build the things to clean. Like, yeah, <laughs> this find is like a, dropping you tool. off on an island exactly. somewhere. And <laughs> build your workbench. <laughs> need a tool, make a tool. I just started um, working on building a ukulele. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, and yeah, I'm cooking, but I'm, I'm cooking for me has always been therapy. Yeah, yeah, the kitchen has always been where I've I've gone, and it's funny. I'll go there for the experience of cooking because uh, people will follow recipes when they cook. I don't. I like to. It's jazz cooking. I like to improvise. <laughs> jazz cooking because I know what I know what I like. I know what flavors I like. And as I did a, a Twitch thing the other day for a couple weeks ago for. The scoops. Yeah. And I gave them a list of ingredients, but I didn't give them a recipe because follow along, do it there to the no taste. There is no recipe. There are recipes Replay out this there. Video. Yeah. But just, you know, do it to taste. Taste as you go, and you'll you'll realize if you like it or you don't. You'll you'll realize you if you have basic knowledge of, of the science of food, you'll know that if it's this, you'll need that. If it's that, you'll need this. Huh. But even if you don't have that basic, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask, but you can always look it up, but you can always just forego it, too. Yeah. yeah. So I've been in the kitchen. I've been out in the yard. I've been recording my own podcast. What's your podcast? Um, it's not out yet, but it's called Man of a Certain Size, and it's nice. dealing with my gastric sleeve. Yeah, you it's, were sharing that with us during the Patreon. As so. I call it, a fat guy's journey to and through gastric sleep, uh, bariatric surgery. There you go. Oh, okay. So you were telling us a little bit in the pre-show, but we wanted to bring it to the main show. Uh, what do you do for a living? What do you do for the folks that don't know who you are? Uh, I'm a male stripper. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I've seen this bit. Yeah. 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 It's very solid. Don't act like you don't know what he does for a living. <laughs> Thanks for pretending you don't dollar, know Dollar, dollar bill, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, I came here because Jim's put a lot of money into our club. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I call him Dr. Make It Rain Jim. <laughs> He's back, guys. He's back. Hey, hey Jim. <laughs> oh, hey. So no, I play um, Baby Francois, the big baby in Mystere by yeah. Cirque du Soleil at uh, Treasure Island. Very yes. cool, man. Yeah. And so how long have you been with the show? Eight years. Holy cow. Yeah. Jeez, that's a lot. I uh, was on tour with another Cirque du Soleil show when the creator of that role and who had been doing it for 18 years passed away. Oh. And I got a call two days later from a friend of mine in casting saying, hey, we don't know what this means, but just be on your toes and be aware. Wow. 
and uh, come to find out that I'd always been on a short list for the to baby. To take that space. Oh, wow. And uh, uh, two months later, they asked me to s- uh, submit a tape. Wow. That's how Cirque works, is that unless they, unless they just want you and cash you right away, they'll say, hey, give us your take on this. Uh-huh. And I was in Costa Rica at the time on tour, and so um, I refused. They also sent me a tape of Francois, the man who created the role, doing it, and I didn't want to watch it. Okay, didn't um, want that to influence you. Yeah, I didn't want to mimic him. Right. And that's the big thing. I mean, and that's having worked for Cirque for the nine months that I had been working, I realized that's what they like, is they like it when you come in and do the exact same thing as the person before you. That way they don't have to change any timing. Uh-huh. And I was like, well... I can't be held down by that. Uh-huh. Yeah. This is this role is is a even though everybody thinks playing a baby is a really easy role, it's a very tough role huh. when you're a fifty year old, six foot five, four hundred and fifty pound man. Sure, right. You sure. know you've got to you've got to convey all the essences that allow people just to go. Oh yeah, that's a it's baby. a baby in yeah. the movement. The yeah. movement has to communicate it absolutely. Yeah. And so I asked my clown partner on that show, Salt and Bonco, to just watch the tape and then direct me. Oh wow! Just give me direction. And so we shot it in the hotel room, uh, sent it back. A week later, they called me and asked me to come out here to Vegas for a um, live audition. Wow. And we were in uh, Puerto Rico doing the show. And they flew me out on a, it was, uh, I guess it was a Wednesday morning. Because we were opening that night. So it was Wednesday morning. They flew me out. I landed in Vegas at 6.30. They took me to the theater at 10. They worked me for about an hour. And then I got back on a plane and flew back to Puerto Rico for the show that night <laughs> to open the show. Jeez. Yeah, it was great. Holy cow. <laughs> um, and then a month and five days later, uh, Christmas Eve, December 2012, they uh, called me and said I got the job. Wow. And, then and the we were closing Salt and Blanco after 20 years on the 31st. So I closed that show, and then the 3rd of January I was here. Um, which was stupid <laughs> because they were on dark and nobody was here. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I could have been at home, you know, at least. So I did. I got here and they said that they couldn't do anything with me. So I went back to San Francisco and basically packed up all my stuff and brought it here. Right. Yeah. It began yeah. the transition. Exactly. So eight years. Yeah. Eight years wow. you've been in Vegas. I have. Been a part of that show. Yep. And, you know, for the first time ever, it's been dark this long. I mean, that thing is a staple of Los It's Vegas. been running 26 years. Jeez. Um, we've never canceled a show. Wow. Um, we have a, uh, our guitarist has never missed a show. Oh, geez. Yeah, in 26 years. years. Wow. Yeah. So Bruce, he holds the times. Guinness Book of World Records for. Wow. Yeah. Most, most, most performances by a male, um, musician. Wow. Wow. How yeah. are your colleagues holding up, man, during this? Uh, it's, we had a, we had a, we do a, a Zoom cocktail hour. Good. Every two weeks. But I'm, I've made it a point. I'm kind of the show daddy. Oh, okay. Uh, there's a, every, a lot of people on the show are, are young. Uh-huh, this is their yeah. first show or second show. And I've always had that fatherly advice giving. Yeah. Uh, this is what you need to do. This is how you should look at it Veteran this Veteran of the industry. Exactly. Kind of yeah. And so I've made it a point from the day one of this is just to call a couple people from the show every day. Good. And, or text them and say, hey, what's going on? I'm how here if you, you need me. And so the naivete of the young members of the cast who are <laughs> really making this all about them mm. is tough mm-hmm. uh, because they don't, uh, they've never been in a situation, I mean, where they've been laid off before. Oh. Right. oh. You know? Uh, I mean, I'm 50 years old. And I thought I'd never get laid off again. Uh-huh. Yeah. How wrong was I? Right. But they're also in a position where... They don't know enough to not trust what's being said. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and or or be skeptical of what's being said. I should say, right? Because I mean, everything not that, blindly trusting. Yeah, not yeah. blindly trusting exactly. And so there, there, there are people who are saying, "Yeah, we'll be back in May, May fifteenth." Oh, hotels boy. Holding, and I'm like, they're just clinging. Yeah, because yeah. we're also dealing with a company that um, is on th- in the throes of filing for bankruptcy. Mm. Oh, no. Um, $900 million in debt. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, and just had their credit rating down, sco- downgraded, which is making it difficult for them to work, find creditors to work with wow. who will help them transition to this bankruptcy. Oh, yeah. So there's a pretty good chance that 
there's some hurdles. Yeah. There, there's a definite, I mean, on the radar is a chance that Cirque may not come back. Wow, man. You wow. Know, that's on the radar. And that's incredible. I, yeah. It's been I, a staple. It's just something that you just assume. Cirque it's Vegas. Right. It's been. always going to be there type thing. Right. And people don't realize that Cirque is so much more than Vegas. Yeah. yeah. Vegas is what made Cirque a, 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 a worldwide name. But Cirque really started out as touring. Oh, and and half of their productions are all touring productions. Oh wow! We have uh, tent shows or uh, big top shows uh, that see twenty five hundred people and tour the entire world. And we also have arena shows, which are for ice hockey arenas or basketball. Oh wow! That are six thousand people and up. Jeez! And uh, then we also have a lot of our side productions. We have we do a lot of uh, creative designing and directing for uh, stars like. Um, one of the halftime shows. Okay, um, like production development. Exactly. But I mean, I've seen Cirque everywhere. I remember going to SeaWorld, yeah. and there was like a Cirque show. I'm like, how the hell is Cirque here? It was Where's Cirque, Shamu? It, it was a Cirque-style <laughs> show. There yeah. are um, there are a lot of people that Cirque really brought to the forefront European. Oh, that's right. It was called Cirque by the Sea. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder if this might be a ripoff. <laughs> it, I, I won't say it's a ripoff because the skills have always been there. It just took Cirque coming onto the forefront. For people to recognize them, because before that, Americans only knew about circus through right, Ringling yeah. Brothers, Circus Vargas, that and type cir- of thing. Like circus is a term that was around before the company circus. Right, okay. it's it's an actual French term. It's a ah. it's a cirque is French for circus. Right, right. So, um, and all the skills that they were being taught, yeah, they were they were learning. You had them here, but. For American audiences in circus, it was spectacle. Right. They wanted to see the elephants. They wanted to see men- the menagerie of animals. They wanted to see the death-defying acts. Cirque wanted to present that, but animals are a lot more expensive than humans mm-hmm. to maintain. <laughs> yeah. And so they took that European approach, and especially with their clowning and their, their characters, right. of making them unique and odd, and instead of... Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. Instead of that... Um, to make it mysterious and deep it, and... Poetic in some ways. And confusing. Yeah, and what yeah. the fuck did I... Pardon my language. <laughs> yeah, no, what hey, the, this is fair. Yeah, what the hell freely. did I just see? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? And wait, is that person really hanging by their hair? Right. Oh, yeah. Or is that person really spitting in a circle with no other... What's going yeah. on? It, yeah. Definitely the, the confusion element, too, which I've never seen your particular show. I have family members that have. Yeah. And that's the first thing they always tell me. I say, how was the show? And they go, so there's this baby. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay, what's the deal with that? And they're like, I have no, no idea. idea. <laughs> I have no idea, but it was very important. And yeah. I'm like, okay, but like, how does that play in? They're like, no clue. I no tell clue. people that the same thing. But it was there's very a, there's, featured. There's a, there's a baby and a giant snail. <laughs> <laughs> and when I give tours after the show, I always tell people, um, people, when we go up and we, I take them to the giant snail, I say, you guys are probably wondering what the deal is with the giant snail, right? And they're like, yeah. I said, this is this show was done in '93. Drugs were rampant <laughs> <laughs> because it's pretty much the truth. Yeah. A lot of marijuana, a lot of cocaine. Yeah, that's what it is. Um, it's just so. drug induced. I mean, I, I've been told about Mysterio. I don't, know, I don't remember if you told me this or somebody else did, but the the entire storyline can be summed up in a sentence, and it is: this is the story of a girl and her pet snail. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, yes. Right. It's mostly, uh, um, it, it, if you want to get down to it, the Bible, and every show has, every Cirque show has a Bible uh-huh. of what the, what the story is supposed to invoke. Uh-huh. Because a lot of them don't have actual storylines. Mm. Right. Um, and that's the thing that confuses a lot of audience members because they come to it not realizing that it's a circus, they're reali- thinking it's a show. Right. And they're trying to find a story to follow. And some of them do, like Ka. Yeah. You know, it's straightforward. Um, but you don't have to have that when you come to our show. Right. Our show is based, if you really want to get down to it, it's a take on Homer's Odyssey. Mm. Oh, okay. And the baby is, is Homer, and mm. you've got the sea in the sky, and you've got the two uh, Sisyphuses, no, the big statuey things. You've got the, wow. the muses. And it's a day, in the life, a, a day in the life of the journey of a baby. Wow. Oh, that's yeah. really cool. Gosh. And, it, you, you, and throughout the entire show, you see things through his eyes, with him in, uh, or with him in the situation, or the situation looking back at him. Oh, okay. And so it's, it's all, if you think of it as camera angles, it's all these camera angles Perspectives. changing. Perspectives. Perspectives, wow. exactly. So it's so interesting. I mean, eight years doing that show, mm-hmm. having the consistency with it, having the mentorship of other cast members, watching them kind of have this just wide, blurry-eyed, you know, possibilities are endless, it'll all be okay, just hug your blankie kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And here you are kind of saying, hey, listen, showbiz is by nature, 
a heartbreaker mm-hmm. in a lot of cases. This is something that's going to be interruptive. We're dealing with a company. I pay attention to their financial health, and I'm looking at this and saying this is going to get weird. How has this been affecting you on a personal level, man? How have you been holding up throughout all this? When I was 12 years old, I was uh, doing theater, and we had a, a, a summer workshop. And one of the classes we could take as participants in this theater company was um, theater from community theater to Broadway. What's your place or something? And the first thing the guy said to, to us, and there was about 20 of us in the group, he said, so you all want to be in theater professionally, right? Run away. Get as far away from this industry as possible. Wow. It's the worst industry to be in. You'll never be recognized. You'll never get paid enough. That's all I tell people when I go talk to students yeah. or whatever. This, this is, is all I tell talks. people. Yeah. Jeez. Get the fuck out. Don't do it. And that really set me up for the misadventures of being a professional entertainer. <laughs> At least they didn't lie to you up front. Exactly. <laughs> because I knew what to expect. I, right. knew, I, I felt the heartbreak. And I think the heartbreak, the, the confusion of being a professional entertainer really came forth uh, when I was 18 years old. Um, I was a clown, an uh, an American-style clown, doing birthday parties and magic shows and the such. And my mom was diagnosed with cancer when I was 17. Mm -hmm. And we I got it was a Saturday afternoon and I had two birthday parties to do that day. And we got a call around 10 a.m. and I'm putting on my makeup in the bathroom. Um, my mother was in hospice, and they said she's not doing well. She probably has like four or five hours left. Oh, jeez. And I'm like, okay, well, four or five hours. These are both one-hour shows. I can be back here out of makeup. The whole family's going to go over to the hospice to be with her. And so I was like, I'm just going to finish my makeup, go out and do the shows. And as I'm walking out the door to go do the show, uh, we get a call and say she's gone. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. And I... S- Still went and did the shows. You're what? Kidding. Wow! Yeah, I still went and did two shows, and one of them happened to be for a family. The second show happened to be for a friend, someone that I knew, and I was doing it for their their child. And uh, after the show, they're like, "Hey, that was great. Uh, what do you got going on? You want to stay for the party?" I said, "I, I really, I can't. Um, my mom just passed away." And they're like, "Oh, when?" I said, "Right before the show." <laughs> and that's when I just crumbled. Yeah. You know, um, I crumbled in the car. I didn't crumble in front of them. I wasn't saving face. It, it just it really didn't hit me yeah. right. until I got into the car. And I sat there and I crumpled. And I was like, all all the emotion went through me. Um, but it was weird because dealing with death, um, I went to an all-boys Catholic school. And the mm-hmm. best thing the Catholics ever taught me was um, allowing those range of emotions that you go through with death, allowing them to happen as they happen instead of... Mm. So I started dealing a year before my mom died with the anger and the depression and the denial, and I was dealing with all that prior to... So when she passed, I had a really good grasp on, okay, this is how I feel. Mm. What I'm doing right now, what what I'm feeling right now is just the sadness that it happened. But I'm not... I, I. I had gone through all those emotions the year and a half prior. Um, my sisters didn't find it that find that very comforting because they thought I wasn't grieving enough, mm-hmm. and uh, wanted me to go see a psychologist. A psychologist, and I went and we sat there and I talked and I said, "This is how I'm feeling, and this is why I'm feeling this." And he's like, "Hmm, mm-hmm. I should be seeing your sisters, shouldn't I?" And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> "But yeah, that's that's a brilliant point. And actually, I I had just made that point in the last episode about the the idea that we have of." assigning some sort of timeline or what should or shouldn't be happening. Right. I should be feeling this way in this time period. I shouldn't be feeling this way in this time period. But that's a really great point that you you have no control over that. You just go with it and you ride the wave. However you feel in that moment is how you feel. Feel what you feel all the time. Absolutely. That's that's exactly what it should be. Um, deny yourself nothing when it comes to feelings either. Right. Um, and – if you can vocalize them, if you can't find your release or outlet for them, because you will need one, mm-hmm. um, I've especially found that dealing with this whole Corona COVID bullshit thing, because my emotions are running the gamut. Um, I was talking to somebody, I'm not sure if it was Jacob or was somebody else about, um, I refuse to use the word depressed right now. 
because I'm not depressed. Okay. But I'm blue. Yeah. You know, I am blue. Yeah, this was in the first quarter of your bottle at, uh, during your rope Jesus. Time. I'm surprised it didn't get deeper. <laughs> um, didn't know there'd be a shrink in the room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I am blue for many reasons. One, because I'm missing working. I'm yeah. missing the people that I work with. I'm missing the social aspect, aspect of my life. Um, and so I'm, not, I'm just a little down. But I'm dealing with it, and I yeah. FaceTime, you know, FaceTiming people every day, four, five, six, seven people a day, you know, having that talk that we would normally have in the dressing room. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just having it, you know, is great. And finding something to to uh, take my time away from not being on stage is great, but it's difficult not hearing the laughter or the applause, because mm. that's what feeds me as a performer, mm-hmm. um, is the laughter, more, more the laughter than the applause, but that's what feeds me, and boy, not having that is I'm having to find different ways, different fuels for you know, me. You that's something I've been really interested in, is the psychology of performance artists being that, that way, that I do constantly hear them tell me that, that there's something about, because I'll ask them, do you feel nervous when they get up there? Things like, yeah, sure, to some extent. You don't realize that's my drug. Like, I crave it, I have to get out there. I'm me right. whenever I'm in that presence of people getting it, being a part of this creative act with me. Right. To just suddenly not have that anymore. Right. To just have that delete from your reality. Not just, these are my coworkers. This is my right. office. This is my normal uh, water cooler talk. Hey, how are the kids? That kind of jibber jabber. That's gone. You know, the, then there's the financial insecurities and stresses that come with that, the uncertainties for the future. But then there's this extra element that I don't think every other American relates to, which is being starved of this performance and creative outlet that suddenly just disappeared from your life. My mantra in life and on stage is a tattoo that I have. I'm going to show it to you, then I'll read it out loud for the listeners. Sure. But it's see, feel, do. Okay. You see something. How does it make you feel? What does it make you want to do about it? Mm. Personally, that's been kind of my driving force for a long time. Uh, that's how I get by through day-to-day processes mm-hmm. is I see it. How does it make me feel? What does it make me want to do? On stage... It's even larger because, as a character, I don't have to think about anything but see, feel, do. Oh, I nice. can just be that character in that moment, seeing yes. something, feeling something, doing something about it. Mm. Yeah, and so it makes it. I, I, when I teach, I try to impart that on people who are listening because it's very difficult to to create a character mm. that is a hundred percent because there's always portions of that character that will be you so if you're able to take you out of the equation and just be that character you have to have a little bit of guideline to it Mm -hmm. you have to have a little bit of structure and i've found the sea feel do is the structure that's perfect for being on stage for me and Mm -hmm. for a lot of other performers pardon me Mm mm-hmm you know, that sea feel do concept almost seems I'm like... I'm a smoker, not a... It's not COVID. I like that this is the worst time in history to have a smoker's cough because yep. everybody's like, well, it's up with this guy. By the way, Jim doesn't always dress like this. Yeah. This is this, his Oh, his you're COVID talking up. about the Boy yeah, Scout not, you, mask? He doesn't usually wear plaid shirts. I, I usually wear Boy Scout <laughs> shirts over my face, but that's for different reasons. Oh, did, you visit, did you visit the in-laws or something? <laughs> yeah, just uh, just making sure he, that I'm he safe. He robbed a train on I, his I way here. I robbed a train. Yeah, this is how I always Well, go. he did just use the term jibber-jabber, so... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's fools with the jibba jibba. But no, that, that see, do, feel concept or see, feel, do, it, to me, that kind of smacks of something we talk about a lot in, in psychotherapy, which is, you know, mindfulness, you know, being present in the now, uh, authentic action. And so, you know, as, as that's kind of your guiding philosophy, mm-hmm. here you are kind of encountering dark, scary times. And so it's interesting to kind of hear you verbally process that, that I'm, I'm seeing this reality. I'm giving myself permission to feel this reality, hearkening back to what your experience has been in grief and the teachings of your Catholic school that kind of equipped you with that. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's okay. Feel the pain, be in the now, accept it, and then doing what you can that's still meaningful in your life, leather work, creative work, outlet work. Supplementing the, the, the loss of what you crave with something that will fill you with the same amount of Glee, mm. joy, mm. experience, trying anyway. concentration, 
um, like working on leather is is a lot like being on stage because I have to be very focused. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to make sure things are perfectly aligned, and I have to make sure that holes are aligned, and I have to make sure that stitches are up and over instead of over and under. And you know, there's a, a, a great ma- great amount of detail there. That's the same for me on stage. On stage, I I have carte blanche on stage at work right. as long as I'm off within you know three minutes and thirty one seconds. Sure. Mm, yeah. So my internal clock. Pardon me again. Mm-hmm. <coughs> my eternal clock is great. Mm-hmm. Uh, eternal? No, my eternal clock sucks. My internal <laughs> clock is great. <clears throat> that three um, minutes lasts a very long time. Exactly. <laughs> and so for me, every night the show is different because right. I allow myself to play in that moment because the audience will will tell me what they want to see. Mm. Right. So I mean, people say, well, how do you choose the papa in the show? And I don't choose the papa. I throw the ball out and I let the ball choose the papa. Mm. Um and then I'll start making decisions from how they interact with the ball mm. as to whether they're going to be a good popper for me or not, whether they're going to play with me or not, whether they're going to be a, a bump on a log or someone who's extroverted, um, or whether they've seen the show, or whether they're a newbie, or whether they're shy. or whether they're, yeah. you know, so. It sounds like even your performance art, it's very much in the now, guided by the moment, mm-hmm. reading the moment, not having too much of a script in yourself, just knowing what you need to do. And you're applying those same principles to this vacancy of time during mm-hmm. the corona era. And I like how you stopped short of saying, Jim, it isn't quite depression. I don't know that I feel that's authentically true. It's blues. Yeah. I do feel low. I do feel discouraged. I'm trying my best to cope with that. Absolutely. By seeing it, acknowledging it, giving myself permission to feel it, and then trying to do what I can in the moment. And also allowing myself the, the freedom to feel that Mm. that's the biggest issue i found with a lot of people that i'm dealing with in the show is that they they feel one emotion Mm -hmm. and this whole thing our life is layered with so many different parameters of emotions and just to feel uh sad about not having a job okay well you feel sad and i i i I'll allow you to feel sad. Mm-hmm. You you are allowed to feel sad about your job, but what else do you feel? Right. What do you feel? What? Why do you feel so sad that you don't get to do this? Mm-hmm. What can you do to make yourself not feel that sad? Mm-hmm. And so I'm having to answer those questions not only for myself, but also for the people that I'm talking with during my show yeah. who are asking me for advice. Yeah, and, um, and on the Twitch, you were describing some of what you've been doing <clears> to cope. Um, some of the ways that you've been handling. By the way, that cough is not from the smoking; it's from the, that malort. I <laughs> oh. <laughs> Even the cough. Has the body the wants malort. the from the COVID. That's <laughs> what's happening. The malort is the the liquid form. I think of the malort the COVID just gave situation. my throat syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But then it cured it. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that note, do you want to take a break, and then we'll come back on the other side and continue the conversation? Yeah, sure. We'll take our uh, our first uh, break. Um, I guess I'm doing these now, aren't yeah, I? Yeah, I like it. So this week's uh, Thera Producer Sponsor, our first Thera Producer Sponsor, is Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop. Woo-hoo! Uh, today's first trivia question in honor of Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop is... Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, this is good. I'm, I'm reading this like this is the first time I've read <laughs> I wrote it. You wrote and I don't even, I was like, hey, this is a good one, guys. Okay. The reverse side of the Oregon State flag has an image of this animal. The reverse side yes. of the Oregon State flag yes. has an image? Yes. The back side of a flag has an image? Yes. That there's, doesn't make any no, sense. No, shut up. I know where you're going. So there's a side that's like the what you would see on an Oregon State flag, you know, if, they, if you just Googled it. Okay. On the back side, on the other side, it's not the same image. There's an image of an animal. What's that's, the animal? Oh, wow. That's got to be the only thing I've ever heard of where a flag has two sides. Yeah. Makes me wonder what's on the be. back of the American. The it, beaver. It's got to be. It's it a is. beaver. It he is. nailed it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he nailed it. It was a it, beaver. If you would like to join Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop to make this show possible, go to patreon.com slash therapy, and thank you for signing up. Gratuitous beaver action on the back of the Oregon flag. Now, in the last episode, the two questions that you asked, the trivia questions, both had to do with states. Correct. And you alluded to that in there's the following episode, in this one, there's a pattern. Yes. This is the first state that's not part of the Confederacy. Yes. All so three of these states have animals in them. Oh, shit. He got it. <laughs> that was it. That was it. The back of all their flags have beavers. That's what it is. Confederate yeah. beavers. Virginia, uh, the Georgia. The beavers were part of the Confederacy. That's where you're yes. going with this. And Beaverton. Exactly. Beaverton, Oregon. That's no. a thing. You may, you That's may have a to... ton of beaver. It is. <laughs> beaver. You, you may have to wait for the forecast. Hell, that ain't ah. no beaver. That's a fucking grizzly. <laughs> 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 Biggest beaver I've ever seen in my life. 
So I bet Beaver's got teeth. We are back <laughs> with our uh, special guest, RJ, who is a Cirque performer. Uh, I think the baby's name is Francois. Baby Francois. Zebebe. Zebebe. And he's brought us bread pudding and a smoker's cough. Yep. And uh, it's been fantastic getting to know I him. I brought and... bread pudding and a smoker's cough. <laughs> <laughs> hey. uh, this is the beginning of a good song. I, I want to hear how that ends. I feel like it's there. So he's been sharing with us some of his story, what it's been like going through the corona era um, as a performer, kind of dealing with that. And you know another thing, RJ. You I like were, how you just rehashed that. Like the people listening, if you're just joining us, part of the first part of the, is, part of the I'm episode. I'm Terry Gross. Welcome to Fresh Air. <laughs> My guest today is RJ. <laughs> RJ, what's your name stand for? <laughs> oh, thanks for that question. <laughs> <laughs> Royalty is my first name, R O Y A L T Y. Oh, there you go. Jamia is my middle name, J A M I L L A. I'd go by RJ too. Yeah. I don't think my parents are black. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm I black from the waist down. <laughs> <laughs> my parents are half black, the bottom half. Um, RJ stands for Robert Jerome. Oh, well, that's, oh, okay. That's yeah. less oh, I was, I was going for Ronald. Thing. Ronald, uh, yeah, no, it's Robert. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, no, and, and recapping some of this, uh, you were also alluding to some of your past, you know, having gone through loss in your family, um, experiencing and encountering grief and depression from an early age. In the Twitch, you were sharing a little bit about kind of the dynamic journey you've been on. And there's a couple of things that you brought up in the Twitch that, if you don't mind, I'd like to bring up into the show. Because I think it's super duper relevant. One was um, going through the gastric sleeve. Mm-hmm. I've had lots of patients go through that. And, and I've always thought it's something really interesting. We've had a lot of listeners of the show write in about that topic because I consider it to be a very psychological experience, not just in the whole there's a behavior pattern associated with all this, but also making peace with the new life you're going to live when you do this. And as soon as you started talking about that, I thought, wait a minute, part of your character involves your body size. Career suicide. <laughs> So this Yikes. is a very, very big decision for you to go through with this. It, it is. Um, the my bosses at work will say that they'll pad me, and I'm six foot five. I'll still be a big baby. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a huge decision to go through, and it's funny. Um, it hit me in January, December. Um, I realized because uh, I just turned fifty in September. Mm. And I was like, fuck, this isn't getting any better, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I also started having people in my life that I wanted to be around a, a lot longer. Mm. Because I've always been, I've always subscribed to the belief that I've lived a good life as long as I didn't hurt anybody that day, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. um, I, try my, I try to go through life uh, day by day just being a really good human or trying mm. to. Um and so I've been pretty okay. Death has always been pretty okay with me. Mm. I'm okay. Mm-hmm. Like, I've died before. Mm. Um, when I had the surgery four years ago, I died on the table. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was in a coma for eight days, you know. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, and so I was okay with death. Mm. I still am okay with death. If it happens, it happens. As long as it doesn't happen painfully. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, if I don't get, like pain, I don't, I really don't care no. for pain. Yeah. If I go instantly, fantastic. If I'm in a, if, if I have a disease, that's going to cause me a, a huge amounts of pain. Um, I'm signing that DNR and I'm saying the first thing that happens to me, do not resuscitate. He's got a yawn. Exactly. Take him, take him, take him, take take him, him now. <laughs> Pull the plugs. <laughs> Sir, I think he's going to be fine. No, no, nope. these hiccups are dangerous. Yes. <laughs> can't. I am mildly hungry. <laughs> look at that! Look at that hangnail, <laughs> Jesus! Nurse, nurse, I have to pee. Yeah. Oh. Okay. oh, he's done. Yeah, bring bring in the chaplain, please. <laughs> I am sitting and don't really feel like standing up. <laughs> my my leg has fallen asleep. Exactly. <laughs> Pull the plug. And so, when I made the decision in January to see what my options were, hmm. um, I looked at all of them, and I've I've I know that I can diet. And exercise and bring myself down 60, 70 pounds. Right. Yeah. I don't think, I didn't, I, that's not, I don't think that's where I wanted to be. I right. wanted to, I've never been skinny except when I was, you know, under the age of 12. Mm-hmm. I was really skinny. Um, latchkey child mm-hmm. coming at home after school, sitting there, doing my homework, eating whatever it was and watching cartoons. Right. And I would love to meet 
the skinny version of me again. Because mm. I remember, I remember being seventeen years old at a gig that happened to be at a hospital. Um, I was uh, I've been performing magic since I was thirteen years old, and I was one of the only magicians in Monterey County. So I was doing a lot of magic gigs, and this happened to be a mind gig at a hospital on the overnight mm. weirdest gig ever, <laughs> because the hospital was getting complaints that the nurses and staff were too loud. So they hired the management hired me as a mind to go around <laughs> shushing people. Oh. <laughs> From midnight to 7 a.m. Oh, my God. It was my job. Also, I... the most passive-aggressive shit I've ever <laughs> Absolutely. heard of. Absolutely. In a long list of passive-aggressive shit from hospital man. Absolutely. You know what? I'm just thinking, right now, I'm thinking about when we worked at the rehab, all the shit that we could have hired RJ for. Just to do. To, to just... Oh, it would have been fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> do when, you find that you're, you're reverting aren't... to an infantile self and yeah. complaining about shit that doesn't matter? Meet RJ. <laughs> He's oh, going like... to wander around for the next half hour as a baby. <laughs> Ther- therapists aren't getting their notes done in time. We can have him go around and like mind as doing notes. Just doing them. Exactly. <laughs> this is what you should be doing. Like a typewriter. <laughs> like pulling the page out, handing it in, going to lunch, coming back on time, starting group. <laughs> we get so many complaints. What is this shit? <laughs> <laughs> RJ's tapping his wrist like there's a watch. Oh, God. Oh, my God. How do we not think of that? Oh, these are great. So if you're out there and you're wondering, how can I increase output from my staff? <laughs> Patronizing them with a mime, a mime yep. is exactly the right way to that do that. That is brilliant. And I remember walking around the, the hospital doing these overnights, and it was for like two weeks. Wow. It was three nights a week for two weeks. <laughs> um. And I got on the scale there, and I remember being 17 years old, and I weighed 306 pounds. Mm. And I was like, holy hell, Mm. I'm huge. Mm. And I've never known myself smaller than that. Yeah. I mean, I've been smaller than that prior to that. Prior, yeah. But as an adult, especially as an adult, I've never known myself smaller than that 17-year-old. You know, one one of the things that he's talking about here is something that we've had listeners write in about. And it's something I'm so glad to hear you talk about. There is an identity to, to your body size. Mm-hmm. And part of the way that we cope with our body size is to accept it, to be that person, to use it to our strengths, to make it part of our, our mojo and make yep. it part of our personality. It's, it's part of the, the thing that we represent. And then to imagine not having that, to imagine losing that. It's a weird thing. It is a weird thing. It's a death of self, oh, in a sense. Absolutely. In order to save your life in some ways, too. But, it, boy, what an, an interesting emotional struggle. I don't know if it's, if it's in, in necessarily a death of self, yeah. self, or if it's a, for lack of a less smarmy term, a, uh, a genuine rebirth. Yeah, there that's, you go. A, that's a good way to put Rediscovering that. Rediscovering who you are. It's, it's like when, when you're a dick to everybody in your life. And you're just you're you're, you're like I that. I feel attacked. That, <laughs> I was gonna say, Jacob, tell us more. <laughs> you're like that megalomaniac <laughs> asshole who who works just, in a sound booth. He right works behind in a sound us booth. Right has, a, has a super beard. Um, you know, for, for metaphorically. Yeah. All metaphorically. And then somebody <laughs> calls you on your shit. Yeah. Right? And they go, you know what? You're being a dick. Mm. You should stop being a dick mm-hmm. because people don't like you, mm. and obviously you don't like you. So stop it. Mm. And then that person goes, that's that's their come to Jesus moment. Yeah. Wow. They're like, oh, yeah. So in January, yeah. it sounds like. I had a come to Jesus moment. Beginning that come to Jesus. And it's interesting how you referenced death and said, you know, his, I'm, not, I'm not doing this strictly for the don't die. I've in some ways reckoned <gasps> with the don't die, you know, and, and I've made peace with it in some ways. But more has happened inside of me to want to go through a transformation. Absolutely. And I also saw the future. Hmm. I saw what future me could be doing. I'm a big, I don't use vision boards because those are lame. <laughs> um, but I, I am a, I'm a big visualizer. Mm. Uh-huh. If I have something that I'm aiming for or what have you, I will visualize it. Yes. So how I got the job with Cirque and how I got the job as the baby yes. right. is I just visualized it happening. And I vis- not it happening, but visualize the outcome of it happening. Right. And so that was one of my processes at the beginning in January was just visualizing what a smaller me would be doing. Mm. And I'm an actor by trade and I've done, you know, I've done Hollywood. I've done, uh, commercials, television, film, theater, Broadway, what have you, but not as a smaller version of me. Interesting. Right. 
and it's definitely scary because in in LA I was a giant fish in a giant pond. Mm. There were n- absolutely no other guys my size who had the talent that I had. Right. And I knew that and I was able to you know parlay that into work. Same thing with San Francisco. So it's now scary that I'm going to be like the smaller fat guys. I see what you mean. Having to work a lot harder. Right. Um just because of my size. No, being but smaller. this is this is something I've heard other entertainers talk about. You know, I I've, I've heard Kevin uh Smith talk about this um as a comedian talking about, you know, Kevin Smith. No, oh, that's the guy from uh, Clerks. Clerks. Who am I thinking of? Kevin the uh, um Kevin James? Kevin James. Yes, Kevin James. Uh, Adam Sandler's friend. Kevin Costner. The Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner worldwide comedian. Yes. Um <laughs> also known for his Wait, size. Kevin James is a comedian? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Uh, Paul Blart, Mark Mall Cop. Wow. So yeah. Also, my my cinema taste. We Jim have not is even that begun. guy. <laughs> yeah. There's Jim, some things like, you need to know about Jim. The, the things that we sit around, like when we sit around talking, and we're like, who buys tickets to Kevin James movies? <laughs> wow. Jim, yeah. As gifts. As gifts. I give I won't that. even watch Kevin James movies on you know illegal streaming. <laughs> right. <laughs> when it's free, oh. I wouldn't do it. But Kevin James, he, he had lost weight at one point in The King of Queens, and he was talking about that kind of off the record and saying, that was my act. Part of my act was I'm this big guy, and then I have the secret weapon of overwhelming comedy power that you didn't expect me right. to have. You know, you meet other guys my size, and you, you might see them as insecure, or you might see them as shy, and I blow your socks off, and part of it was my secret weapon you didn't see me. Right. And, and like Louis Anderson has said the same thing. Yep. That Louis Anderson wouldn't have been a known guy if he hadn't had this very obvious thing about him that was very, you know, you saw him visually, you didn't forget Louis Anderson. Right. Even the gap in his teeth, they were like, you're going to fix mm-hmm. that? He's like, no. No way. Yeah, why no, would you? I want you it to worked see for all Letterman. That. Yeah. Right, yeah, it works for Lemon. And so I totally understand what you're trying to say with that, that there is going to be this whole transformation, but by beginning to see it and then to feel it, now you prepare to do it. Exactly. Nice callback. Um, <laughs> I'm really excited because if I'm going to be creating this quote-unquote new me, should I grow my hair back? Should I, get, should I start using toupees? Mm. I mean... All options are on the table. All options are on the table. Should yeah. I go back into being a leg model? Should I start doing <laughs> porn again? I mean, they're all going to be there. Yeah. And my joke... And the thing is, when you're a guy of my size, to stop people from picking on you, especially when you're young and as you get older, is you learn to pick on yourself first. Uh, right. Steal the thunder. Exactly. Yeah. So I have every fat guy joke that there's ever known. Right. And I've used them, and I've written a lot of them. Um, and it's going to be fun to see what my... Um, you have to come up with a whole new bit. Either a whole new bit or, or what my what my foible is going to be next. Right. Well, you I know? remember this, because I've, I've seen you perform, but only in the magic context. <clears throat> And I remember that you made a quick joke, and it was it was very tasteful. It was easy to do. It disarmed the audience. Yeah. It immediately had the effect of we all feel safe in your presence. This guy's here for us. He's a buddy, and he's just everybody's just like okay. okay I learned cool. that when I when I was young and doing magic, and I'd walk up because I would do close up magic, so I'd uh, walk around magic, and I would walk up to people and you know being six foot five 400 plus right. pounds it's intimidating imposing and intimidating yeah. so they would everybody would instantly think that i'm the bouncer right oh, so okay. I, I learned to diffuse that situation with uh what's the word for when you make fun of yourself something self-deprecating dumb. humor thank you um in a way yeah. i would walk up and say boy are you guys in luck my name is RJ, and I'm here to entertain you. Yes, that's right. I'm a stripper. <laughs> right. Don't worry. Right. It's a small show. Yeah. <laughs> they would do exactly what you guys yeah. would do. Yeah. And, and I said, I'm glad you're laughing because I'm not really a stripper. I'm worse. I'm a magician. Let me yeah. show you a trick. <laughs> and then it launches right into uh, Exactly. Yeah. Like, I remember Chris Farley's bit whenever they did the Chippendales joke yeah. on SNL. And, like, he's competing against, oh, God. Patrick Swayze. Patrick Swayze. Swayze. And, you know. One but, ton tomato. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, he killed it. And But, again, it disarms everybody. Yep. It's very fluid. And so it's interesting for you as a performer who has already woven this into everything that you do as an advantage to have to make this choice and say, I'm choosing to do this knowing that I'm going to have to relearn. Yep. How to well, do it. That's the exciting part. It is exciting. It, is, it seems like you're, you definitely have an optimistic 
perspective to this. Yeah. Uh, well, should there be any other? Right. Well, yeah, an optimistic I mean, outlook. Yeah. You're not noticing what you're losing. You're looking at what yeah. you're gaining. Oh, I'm, oh, 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 I know. I'm noticing what I'm losing. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I talked to my friend Johnny Miles, who's in the show with me um, today, and he FaceTimed me, and he was frying bacon. Mm. Oh. I was going to, okay. The sound so of sizzling bacon. That Just was... the sight and sound, because I've intentionally taken it out of my diet. Yeah. Just so I wouldn't, wouldn't be so hard afterwards. Mm-hmm. Because two weeks prior to the surgery and three months after, it's all liquid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I was going to ask about that as far as the because I know that there's a huge change in your diet both before mm-hmm. and after, and how our food sometimes is very connected to our emotions. Yeah, and have you had that experience of that that sense of you know what you're losing as far as food, how that's affected you emotionally? Absolutely, I've had to say goodbye to some beautiful stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. for now. Yeah. Uh, food for me, the actual eating of the food has been nothing but sustenance for me. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't uh, uh, binge eat. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, and that was out of stupidity. Um, there's, there's not a go-to food that I have if I'm feeling depressed. Like some people go to a, a quart of oh, ice okay. cream. Right. right. Um, for me, I think the greater distraction is the cooking of it. Yeah, because you were talking about that being therapeutic for I you. love it. I love Interacting with food. And having people come over and, you know, I, I cure my own meats and I roast my own coffee and I make ice cream and wow. I'm learning how to make cheese. And all of that stuff is stuff that I can give away. Right. Right. So that makes it very, very exciting for me. I mean, I have a meat cave. Uh, I think I said this on the show the other night. It's not really a meat cave. It's two fridges in my garage. But <laughs> it's where I hang the meats that I cure. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, down the road I can have a taste. We have a a, a scoop friend, pardon me, mm-hmm. uh, who just had the surgery done a month and a half ago, mm. and he's down ninety five pounds in a month. Oh yeah, wow, yeah, and that's exciting to me. But he said uh, there's a, a process in this called dumping, mm-hmm. and dumping is when you eat too much, mm-hmm. and your it affects your body, and your stomach shuts down, and your entire body shuts down, and it takes about three days, two to three days to recover. Mm. And he dumped on two and a half chicken wings. Yeah. Oh, wow. That scared yeah. me. Yeah. That scared me. I'm like, two and a half chicken wings. Mm-hmm. And I realized, wow. I realized, well, okay, okay, but I have that knowledge now. Yeah. Because nobody could tell me beforehand what would cause me. I mean, they would say, well, if you eat too much in your stomach. You'll know. Yeah, yeah well. I don't want to know what is. T- I want to know actually. what is too yeah. much. <laughs> yeah. now, you see, on that topic, I, I had a patient uh, in this last year in 2019, who we began working together in part because she was planning on going through with this, and she knew that it was going to be a deeply emotional experience. She was already having a lot of emotional resistance, and it was interesting because as we were preparing for the surgery, you go through the classes, or at least she did. There were classes associated with the clinic, and they mm-hmm. wanted you to prep and begin training on this. And for her, one of the things that really collided with her was food is socializing to her. Oh, that's the toughest. It's going out with a friend and getting some lunch. It's going out to dinner on a holiday. It's after show work. And and she was like, Jim, this is so hard to imagine a reality. I mean, there's very strict limitations on alcohol. There's very strict limitations on what how much your portion can be. You're supposed to drink a glass of water before and after and all this other crap. And she was like, I don't want to do that. I want to order a big thing, an appetizer, share with everybody. I don't want to feel like I stand out, and I don't want to do this. And she can still order a big appetizer and share with anybody. Just don't have any Don't have any of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you, are you still in contact with her? Still working with her. Um, change her, help, have her work on changing it from food is socializing mm. to food is just fuel. Yeah. Oh, that's a good fuel. Yeah. It's just fuel. Yeah. yeah. I the have symbolism. To yeah. It's amazing oh. how many things food yeah. is to a human right. being. It's Find other ways of socializing. That's what I'm having to do. Yeah. And thank God for this quarantine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because the quarantine is now allowing me to use the FaceTime, use the Zoom, yeah. use the Skype, write actual letters and mail them. Right. Yeah. See, and this right. is getting more and more popular. And I love this. People using food not as a social tool because I hate just going out to eat with someone 
and to to visit with them. Right. Right. Because I would much rather like I'll use booze as a social tool. Yeah, I right. use coffee. But, yeah. but I mean, like I can sit there and have a drink with someone, and we can have a super in depth conversation. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, like R- RJ and I drank together on on Zoom on on Road. Oh together. no, I drank. You watched. <laughs> I drank about, I, you drank a bottle of bourbon, <laughs> which is a lot. I drink about a half a bottle of bourbon. We've yet oh. to see how much it takes to get uh, Jacob to agree to therapy. But this so is that's the day I'll know he's drunk. Right. <laughs> the day this he is... texts me and says. All right, let's do this. Why, would well, I, why on incre- earth would I text you? <laughs> if you increase his day rate, he'll agree to therapy. <laughs> That's true. There's a price. There's a price for everything. <laughs> but you brought up a really good point. And I, I've even done this myself when when I get really focused into my exercise program and eating healthy. If I change my perspective and I look at it as just fuel, it's, it's nice. not about it's not about entertainment. It's not about just consumption. It's... I'm eating this chicken breast and broccoli because my my body needs it. Right. So I'm just putting fuel in my car. And that that actually can be translated into every aspect of one person's life. Sure. You know, smoking. I'm having to quit smoking right now because right. prior uh, post surgery, it's it takes a little longer for the body, to, the human body, to heal. So I'm actively trying to passively aggressively <laughs> <laughs> trying to quit smoking. Right. Um, I'm not looking f- to supplant that with anything else, um, but I'm having to tell myself when I don't smoke, you know what? It's it, I'm I'm not smoking this cigarette because I want to heal faster. Right. You, you remind know? yourself of the truth. And then when I have a cigarette, it's like I'm having this cigarette because I want it right now. Okay. In spite of. Yeah. In yeah. spite of. Yeah. Aware of what I'm doing. So I, I'm not feeling the guilt of smoking. But I'm also not feeling the pressure to not smoke. Right. Right. Yeah. You know? And so it's, I've cut, I was due two, as of two months ago, I was two packs a day, and now I'm down oh. to about 10 cigarettes a day. Wow. Oh, okay. So that's a reduction of 30 cigarettes a day. Yeah. yeah. Um, except when I drink a lot and then I just smoke like a fish. <laughs> that's true. I, did, I was, oh was going to bring gosh. it up, but I did notice some <laughs> cigarettes happening on the Twitter. The, that's the thing. I, I woke up the next morning, well, next afternoon. And and two days and later, two immediately days later. wanted a cigarette and opened the pack and it was gone. <laughs> and I'm ashes, like, ashes, Del Taco, what? and empty bottles all around me. <laughs> this is the last time I talked to Jacob. <laughs> oh, it's just horrendous. I told RJ in, in text. He texted me the next day. He said, "Don't ever let me drink a whole bottle of whiskey again." And I said, uh, "I didn't notice that you were drinking the whole thing." He held it upside down <laughs> until the end. <laughs> Until it was too late. Until I mean, it was I went too like, late. oh, it, like I noticed when there was maybe like I don't know, fifteen percent of the bottle left. I didn't realize. I was like, well, I have nothing to do now. Yeah, oh, might, as well, might as well let this go. <laughs> I will say that I wasn't, ha- I wasn't hungover. Like I didn't want to vomit. Good whiskey, man. Right. Good, that's good whiskey, man. That's and good no, whiskey. Um, I just felt like I drank a bottle of whiskey. Yeah, yeah. You just felt like you got hit by a bus. Yeah, oh. we have a word for this. <laughs> so, last thought on on the uh, the gastric sleeve, you know. Oh, we can talk about that forever. Come I think on, it, no, I it think up. it's super relevant. Okay. I think everybody, you know, relates to it and I like that we're discussing how food is more it, it's it's hard, it's a discipline to bring it back to this is just fuel and you have to tell yourself that, but you relate to the people out there that are like Man, food became a lot of things. It became it like you know Jacob was saying how I socialize, right. how I celebrate when oh, I work hard. How I hard. socialize too. I, I've earned this dinner. I, we're going to a fancy restaurant. I get something really nice. I get to splurge. It's it's how I reward myself. It's, it's how after I the show. I don't want to cook. Let's stop by drive through. Right. It's you know, how it's I've all that it. shit. There you yeah, go. It's well, all those. Things. When I was when I started dating Laura. Mm-hmm. Because Laura has Wait, celiac. you like girls? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's just check it. Well, also, she's a Nazi. And girls. Yeah. So, so, she's an ostrich? She, no, she's a Nazi. Oh, okay. <laughs> but she might be in an a, ostrich. In addition to, in addition to and being... And when she gets scared of something, she hides her head in the ground. <laughs> yeah. In addition to being an ostrich Nazi, she has celiac disease. We just call them nostrich. Nostrich. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so she's got a gluten allergy. Yeah. So we can't... Very specific. We, yeah. Way. So like I had to... When we first started dating, like I had to come up with new creative ideas for dates because it was right. always going out to eat. Right. And I, it's like... Well, I'm an incredible <laughs> vegan cook because I dated a woman that was vegan. That is, oh, yeah. So I have a lot of great, vi- great vegan recipes. The sad thing they don't tell you in becoming vegan is that Potatoes are vegan. Oh yeah, and Oreos are vegan. Ah, see, <laughs> got to so, read the full fine you gotta, print. Yeah, but the things you add to potatoes aren't vegan. Yeah. No, but you eat a 
fuck ton of potatoes. See, all the, yeah, I opened the, ba- you know, the you, Oreos and put bacon in there. So well, my not, Oreos not as are vegan. Not vegan. If you add the Oreos to the potatoes, then you should be good. That's oh, that'd vegan. be awesome. My favorite Super vegan. Oreo potatoes. But but food is vegan. emotional and it is situational. And Absolutely. like if you're dating yeah. somebody that food can is or can't, everything, it shows up everywhere. You yeah. know, it's and literally that's what I'm a social. Life. I I love not having food to socialize around because right. I I don't want to yeah. meet people for dinner when right. we when we have people over to the house. Sj is like you know can we what you know we should make some we should make some food or something. I'm like I don't want to make food for something like yeah. people are coming over. We're gonna hang out like we can put some chips out or something. Right. Yeah. You don't then, or you can make a killer meal. thing of nachos because you do make good nachos. I make I make good nachos and gumbo. I've oh. heard. Gumbo is a whole thing. That's a whole. That's a <laughs> that's a process. That's a day. That's a day of my life. That's gumbo day. Uh, but no, I mean like I don't want to sit there and have a meal and have everybody be chewing. Yes. And so I yeah I want to I want to sit around you know, maybe have drinks or not. I don't right. really even care about that. Yeah. yeah. Yet there are times where I want to do a full on. Sit down. You're going to get a five course meal for me. Right. Yeah. I want to cook for my friends. That's cool. Like I used to do. I I I haven't didn't haven't done it this year because we're not up to it yet. But I do an orphans Thanksgiving and or an orphans Christmas. Wow. And it's for people that I know who don't want to be with their families over the holidays. Mm -hmm. Right. Come to my house. Um, Thanksgiving. I'll make a traditional Thanksgiving. Christmas. I'll I'll we'll swank it up. Like yeah. uh, Two years ago, I did. a butterfly leg of lamb on the grill. Dang. And I did a big old pot of cioppino, which is uh, you know, ta- ta- yeah, Italian uh, fish stew. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And uh, sit around and commune. I, the, there is something so satisfying about the communal quality of eating together. It, yes. Is that something that is part of the way that you've had to approach this surgery? Is that something you've had to grapple with? Just in the same way you have to redo your entertainment identity, have you had to say, how am I going to redo my cooking identity in this new reality? I, I, I've i thought about that. I realized it's no longer – it's not going to be a handicap for me. Right. And it's not going to be a crutch. It's going to be an extension of my ability to control my intake. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I can still do the same meals for everybody. I just don't have, I mean, I don't have to eat them, number one. Mm. Or if I want some of it, I can take some of it. Yeah, right. the taste it's my does. choice. Yeah, you'll yeah. have a taste. But I, I'm not, I, the meal is not what concerns me. Right. It's the people around the table enjoying that with me. Yeah, That's having, what makes Having it a fun. joyous feast is, is different from just socializing around food, I right. think. It's a di- it, it's a it, same family, but different level. Yeah, right. I would agree. Yeah. Let's. Take our last break, and we're going to come back. Let's talk about. Uh, some... I actually have a big question for. Okay. Me. Yeah. All right. So we'll hold that. Hold, the hold that thought. Theme. Hold that thought. All right. We're going to take our next break. Uh, our next Thera producer sponsor is Dr. Ben Don. Uh, today's trivia question. Jailbird Don, as they call him, <laughs> in honor of Ben, is this city in North Carolina is a major port and it's also where many movies and television shows, such as Dawson's Creek, have been filmed. Huh. Name Hollywood. In North Carolina, Hollywood, yes. North Carolina. Hollywood, North Carolina. Good job. Dollywood. Port. In Bollywood. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to join Ben that Don and make the show the possible, <laughs> you can go to <laughs> patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Okay, so the theme with all four states, you've been arrested in all four of them. No. Okay. You then should got, have been I'm, arrested I'm in all four of them. I don't even know. Was North Carolina? Car- yeah. What, what is the theme? I got Each it. one if of those stupid, wait, I'm going to The states like, were Georgia. Georgia, Virginia, Virginia, Oregon, and North Carolina. Correct. Those are all states. Ah, uh, he got oh, it. Oh, he nailed it. They're squares. Wait, Those Virginia's are four not states. a square. Why are, you, all why named... are you only a life coach? That's <laughs> what I want to know. They're all named after English royalty. No. Carolina's named after the K- Queen Carol. Here it is. Sweet. They're all Carolina. the states that those their producer sponsors live in. I hate you. <laughs> 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 Throw him out! Get him out of here! I put, a, I put a lot of work into this. Yeah, that's really cool. He's a witch! <laughs> He's a witch! Burn him! Yeah. So, that was very nice of you. I thought we were going to get something that we could figure out. Yeah, goddammit. I was really trying to solve this problem. <laughs> uh, I, I knew that. Why didn't you Smitty's know that? Smitty's from Virginia. Yep. Okay, I did know that. Jake's so, from Georgia. Jake's from Georgia. We knew that. Okay. Oregon. I didn't know about that. Yeah. 
Who's from Nathan? Oregon? Nathan's from Oregon? I think so. Okay. I hope For so. For the purposes of this. God, I hope so. Or we For just the lost the fucking this, there, yes. producer. He's <laughs> 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 like, well, <laughs> you made my decision yeah. easy. <laughs> He's not from Oregon, but he uh, loves beaver. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that, that We're all from Oregon in a sense. <laughs> All right, so back with RJ. Uh, if you're just joining us, this is fresh air. Does this mean you're keeping me for segment three? Yes. You, wow. You just, yeah, we. Yes. Uh, our apologies to Matt Damon. This is. This uh, we're is gonna the, have uh, to bump him. This is the longest any guest has been able to tolerate us. Yeah. No, thank God. Oh, you guys are tolerating <laughs> me, Jesus. So in the Twitch, as you were sharing about um, the depression background and <laughs> and what you've been doing to cope. Um, I don't know if it was you had finally had enough whiskey to share about this, and maybe we need to pour some right now if you want some more Malort. <laughs> uh, but you were talking about microdosing a little bit. Tell us a little oh. bit more about that. T- tell us what uh, what you're talking about, what's been going on. Uh, I love psychotropics. Okay. I do. Um, it also... I can tell you that was uh, RJ talking about that is not a result of whiskey. Okay, yes, no. <laughs> okay. that's no, no. that's Our, a... this is something RJ is happy to talk about. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I did my He's first... an evangelist for it exactly. <laughs> outside of Starbucks. Excuse me, sir. Have you heard about LSD? <laughs> I had my first acid experience in the most stereotypical way possible. Hmm. I was at a Grateful Dead concert. Oh, <laughs> of course. At yeah. Shoreline Amphitheater. <laughs> yeah. the price of admission. Fish open. <laughs> yeah, <Exactly>. fish. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I went with Shane LaDuc, who was the scenic designer at the theater I worked at at mm. the time. And I had never done acid before. I, he was going to be my, my – everybody else on the – I mean, it was – there were a lot of hippies on the crew. And he was going to be my guardian mm-hmm. that day. So we find a place on the grassy knoll. Have, you need a guide. You need a guide. You need. Yeah. You at least need somebody there who's who's compass mentis who will, right? Yeah. You know, not let you do the stupid shit. Yeah. Right. right. Talk you down. Yeah. And so uh, he gives me a, a little tab. He says, "Go ahead and just stick that in your tongue. It'll dissolve." I'm like, "All right, fine." He says, "I'm gonna I'm gonna go grab some food and stuff. I'll be back about a half hour." I'm like, "Great." He comes back about a half hour later, and they and he's like, "So how do you feel?" I'm like, "I feel nothing. I honestly feel nothing." Huh. He's like, oh, wow. All right, well, you are a big big guy. Um, here, take another one. Oh, no. Oh. So I take yeah. another one, and we're sitting there, and we're watching. It's not, unfortunately, it's not fish. It's some other. I, I feel was... nothing. Were you always a dragon? <laughs> <laughs> well, about. These about, pills are shitty, dragon. About 30 <laughs> minutes later, he asked me again, how do you feel? I said, honestly, I really feel nothing. Oh, no. Come so on. So he gives me a third time. Oh. <laughs> and I take it. You got uh, a bad guy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I what was this guy's it. job again? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Scenic designer. So I take it, and he, and he stops, and he goes, wait, how many of you have? <laughs> and I said, this is my third. He goes, whoa. Whoa, what have I done? <laughs> Three is too many. <laughs> the minute the Y came off of many is when it hit me. Oh, no. Um, fell right over. Oh, oh. boy. Um, had a very interesting conversation with a snake in a porta potty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which turned out to be Jerry Garcia. Nope, was my penis, and I pissed all over myself. Um, but it was the subsequent twelve hours later that I was coming down that I started connecting with who I was, hmm. and connecting with what was going on around me, and allowing myself to be introspective and. Mm-hmm. I was like, I kind of dig this. This is awful harsh. Mm, yeah, pretty intense. Um, and then a year later, a friend of mine uh, said, hey, I, I'm going to make some mushroom tea. You want some? I'm like, what's mushroom tea? Miso soup. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you've never done mushrooms? I'm like, no. It's, it's just like acid, except it's natural. I was like, <laughs> okay. go on. Yeah, tell me more. <laughs> so um, she made some tea, and uh, I took it, and... It was a lot faster than the acid, mm. a lot more comfortable than the acid, mm. um, but also it allowed me to control my destiny within that moment. Sure. Yeah. It didn't feel like you were just holding on to a tiger's tail. Exactly. Um, and it lasted just as long, and it was a far more psychedelic trip than acid was for me. Um, and one of the things you should know about me is that when I do LS, oh, sorry, when I do mushrooms, Two things happen. I always mistake something for peanut butter. (laughs) 
and I always see Charles Bronson somewhere. <laughs> that, which leads me to believe that Charles Bronson is my spirit guy. <laughs> I think that's where that goes. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's the right so, one. That's the right one. Eight, that was 18. So from 18 on, I've been, I've been experimenting with, with mushrooms quite often. Okay. Uh, quite a bit. When I hit my 30s is when I started... Uh, Microdosing or, or experimenting with microdosing, mm-hmm. um, and I think a reason I did it when I hit my thirties is I, it was the first time that I was out in the world without without a safety net. Mm. I wasn't working at a theater company. I wasn't. Uh, I was on my own in San Francisco doing television. I was doing film. I was doing commercials, and I was also doing magic. Mm-hmm. And I was beholden to no one. Mm-hmm. And I. I found myself saying yes to a lot of projects and then just completely getting overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a way to, uh, at first it wasn't trying to figure out what was going on. I wanted a way to make it through that was kind of like, I'd be okay. I'd be numb-ish. I would still be productive, but I I just, I didn't want to feel at that point. Mm -hmm. I had to make it through. It was, and it was a year that that happened. I just I wanted to make it through. I wanted to make it through. This is evening me out. This is I'm, my anxiety is gone. My my temper is gone. I'm able to do these many different projects that I'm doing, and everybody's getting the, the, the appropriate amount of me that they should be getting. Mm. <clears throat> Post that, I took a year off um, because I uh, I really felt that I was. Um, addicted is not the right word. Maybe dependent. Dependent is self medicating. It, dependent is more appropriate. Mm. Um, and then my dependency changed from that point uh, <laughs> to Norco. Oh yeah. Um, mm. Because I had broken my wrist, I was in a, a motorcycle accident and broken my wrist, and they'd given me Norco, and Norco gave me the same feeling without the psychotropics. Right. Norco gave me the. Everything's okay. Euphoria. Mm-hmm. And the side effect is that it made me very chatty. Yeah. And so I did that for eight months. Mm. And I was like, fuck, what is going on? Mm. I am not that guy. I'm only supposed to be addicted to booze and, and cigarettes, according to my family <laughs> history. That's it. And so I, I uh, and I really was never, I've never been a big marijuana smoker until, you know, uh, the last four years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was like, what the fuck am I so then it, it went to drink. Mm. You know, and uh it was funny. Uh, I was again not an alcoholic, but I was de- I was dependent on it to to control my moods and control my surroundings. And then I got smart. Uh I just went, you know what? I need to control my surroundings. I need to be in charge mm. of my daily processes. Mm. So there was a, about a five-year window until I was about 27, 28 that it was basically smoking and coffee. It was cigarettes and coffee. Mm. That was my life's blood. Mm-hmm. And then right around 29, 30 is when I started microdosing again. Mm-hmm. Well, I started microdosing. Um, and that was, it was, a, it was the smallest, like a, a, a the smallest amount I could do just to keep me creative. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, what do you mean keep you creative? You're a creative individual. I know I'm a creative individual, but I am so creative that I will shoot off in 19 different directions Mm -hmm. and never finish a single one of those projects, never Mm -hmm. creatively finish a single one of those projects. These allow me to, the microdosing allowed me to just slow down a bit, Mm -hmm. see everything, Mm -hmm. you know, Choose what I wanted to work on. Choose what I would be creative with, and then devote my full energy to that one thing hmm. at that time. And it changed daily. Um, it wasn't the same thing. It wasn't. And now, as I'm older, and I've been microdosing for what twenty years now, uh, it really is. It's not even a dependency anymore. Hmm. It's like I will microdose once or twice a week now, just because. I feel well, especially right now with what's going on, mm. is that I feel the need to supercharge my focus mm. and also just narrow my focus mm-hmm. uh, because so many things are going on in my head and in the world. And if I choose to focus on what they're focusing on, God, I'm going to be a mental wreck. If I choose to focus on that project, is it, is it really going to? Is it going to fulfill me? Mm-hmm. And so. 
I think the most educated guess I can give to why the microdosing helps me is that it allows me to be. Sure. It just allows me to be. Uh, be present, be there, be here, be smart, be quiet, mm. be introspective. It, it, all those words, everything. It just allows me to be. Mm. And it's not a dependency. It's once or twice a week if sure, I right. feel the need. Mm -hmm. um, and then, don't get me wrong, every year on my birthday, I do a fuck ton of mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, I went fishing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Last year, I, I decided for my birthday I was going to go fishing up in Utah. And this little lake up in the up above, uh, past Mount Zion, but up above in the mountains. And I, I had, I think I had two ounces of mushrooms with me. I was like, all right, I have a three day weekend from work. Mm. I'm going to drive up Wednesday night. I'm sorry, drive up Tuesday night because we had Wednesday, Thursday, Friday off. Drive up Tuesday night, camp that night, get up the next morning, dose a little bit of mushrooms, do some fishing, campfire, yada, yada, yada. So I get up there, camp. Next morning, I wake up. And uh, I moved the car to a more suitable location, which is right on the lake. Mm. You know, I'm uh, 50, 50, 50 feet from the uh, shore. And I was like, all right, let's go ahead and just, just wait. I better make some things in advance. <laughs> so I got the jar of peanut butter out that I bought. <laughs> my poster. Yes. <laughs> poster. Put, it, <laughs> put, it on the, put it on the tailgate of my little <laughs> Honda Element. Yeah. Got the paracord that I brought with me. It's always in my fishing bag. Tied it around my waist and tied it to the trailer hitch on the back of my car. So that I won't wander. 49, 49 feet from the water. Oh, yeah. that's my well thought God. Yeah. And then I taped the peanut butter to my hand. And, and this is, I, I've made all these discoveries, <laughs> and I knew it was going to take quite a bit. The, the level of responsible aspect. Oh, you have uh, to yeah. be responsible. If you're there. tripping alone, you have to be responsible. You've got to be ready to go. Yeah. If you're tripping with, dip, tripping with a designated sober person. Well, you, that didn't work out for you either. It's a grateful well, dead. He wasn't that, sober. He wasn't I, sober. I came to find oh. out. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. like putting him in a pet dispenser yeah. and just giving them to you. And so I, I, I ate six, probably no, I ate five caps and probably four stems. Just chew them up. And that, by the way, if you ever want to never do mushrooms again, chew them. <laughs> because they're the most odd. They taste, they taste mo terrible. Malort tastes better than, <laughs> yeah. Uh, tastes like you're eating a fungus. Exactly. And I just started, tri I started yeah. tripping balls. Just tripping balls. These were some excellent, excellent psilocybin. Okay. Um, to the point where <laughs> I, I don't think I fished at all uh, for the three days that I was there. All I know is that the Saturday morning I was waking up after a night um, and going, "Wow, I got to drive back to uh, got to drive back to Las Vegas and make it before showtime." And the fuck is there peanut butter taped to my hand? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a it was a it was a wonderfully decadent three day trip. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you'll you'll definitely go uh, go hard on special occasions that kind of thing. The micro dosing at this stage, it sounds like is a way to, as you kind of said, be. It, it kind of like is a noise cancellation mm -hmm. device. Like it takes away the noise and the clutter. Bose headphones. It's that. You know? yeah. I mean, and the, and the people microdose for different reasons. There are mm -hmm. certain people that will microdose strictly for medicinal reasons. There mm -hmm. are. And here, okay. Um, can I share with you peyote experience? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Please uh, do. I, I, had never, <laughs> I had never done peyote before, and this was about five years ago, and I was having back problems for the first time in my life. Mm. And it was because of the way I walked as the baby, and ju I would jump down into this moat, which was three feet below me, and just everything mm. getting compacted. Um, and I knew, because of my previous Norco experience, that I did not want to take um, prescription medications for it. Because mm. I, 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 I'm a creature, I have it. Yeah, I'll admit it. Um, but I called a friend of mine who's working with senior cancer patients down in L.A., and she's using alternative mes medicines, i.e. marijuana, mushrooms, peyote. I didn't know about the peyote at the time. And I called her and said, hey, because she was coming to visit, I said, can you bring me anything for pain? She goes, hey, I'm working on this thing with, with peyote. Have you ever done peyote? I'm like, I've mm. never done peyote. She's like, I'm working on this thing with peyote, and I, you want to try it? I'm like, okay, we'll try it. So she comes to visit me, and she makes a very weak peyote tea. Um, she said, this is not going to be a, a soul-searching, you know, spirit-guided uh, journey. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is just to implant some stuff in you 
Mm-hmm. It's about three hours, and it's a little it's a little walk in the park. I'm like, all right. She said, and she said, before you drink the tea, I just want you to one thing: you need to see yourself. Mm. I just need you to see yourself, and then I'll be here talking you through things and stuff. But I just need, and I don't remember anything she said. Mm-hmm. But I drank the tea and I'm laying there on the couch and she's sitting next to me and she's holding my hand. And it's a very, very warm, fuzzy type of environment. And especially with like the peyote and mushrooms, you start to get the warmth. Mm-hmm. You start to get the, 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 the warmies. And uh, all of a sudden, I popped up on my stomach looking down. Mm. And there I am standing there waving. Oh, you're looking down wow. at your stomach. I'm looking at my stomach past my, like, through my feet. And there's, yeah. there I am on my stomach. Oh, wow. Waving. He walks up. Walks up, looks at me, walks onto the side of my head. And the next thing I know, my vision changes to his vision, and he's crawling in my ear. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So seeing yourself yeah. as you, little you, yeah. is going into Any your me. ear. Crawls into my ear and starts crawling and starts digging its way through my spinal cord and back muscle and stuff to the point where my pain was. Wow. And I, unbeknownst to me, she's guiding me through that part. Okay. I, I don't know if I hear her or not. I just know what's happening. Okay. And he finds this undulating black mass. You remember what, um, oh, who was the dirty kid on the char- on Charlie Brown? Pig oh, pen. Pig pen. pen. Yeah. And he had that big, the, all the dust, dust around cloud. him. And stuff. This yeah. was a black, massy dust cloud with things. And the mini me walks up to it and grabs it and spins it around. And it turns out to be my artistic director from the show that I'm doing. Uh-huh. And mini me just starts beating the crap out of him, <laughs> pummeling him. And uh-huh. for every hit that he hits, the pieces of him fly off and dissipate. And it finally gets to nothing. And it's gone. And, and I swear to God, I had no back pain. Wow. None whatsoever. Very interesting. And I was like, oh, if that's the case, I've got this hemorrhoid. This <laughs> <laughs> so it climbs down my spine to my anus. Again, undulating black mass. Same thing. Spin it around. My artistic director. Pain in the ass as well. Yep. Starts pummeling it. This time when they break off, it turns into a little smaller versions of him. So for every hit, he's breaking into three pieces, three smaller versions. So now there's all these little tiny like artistic directors. And he, <laughs> He's jumping around, stomping on him, falling on him, squishing him, finally squishes him. To this day, and that came out, and to this day, I've not had back pain nor that hemorrhoid. Wow. That's fascinating. So physician heal thyself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And Um, I think a lot of that kind of ties into what we know about pain uh, from the perspective of, like, there's there's a a physical representation of pain, and then there's an emotional representation of pain. Mm-hmm. So we learn about that a lot in, you know, treatment and when we're working about with, with uh, folks with an opioid dependence disorder, mm-hmm. you know, because a lot of them are really focused on, well, I can't stop using this pain medication because then my pain's going to be back. I mean, yes, to some degree, for a lot of folks it will be, but it's not as large as what it is. Once you mm-hmm. learn to manage the emotional aspect of pain, it becomes a lot more manageable. Right. Which is what's interesting about that. I mean, like, obviously a psilocybin or even peyote, it's not indicated as a hemorrhoid cream, but the, the aspect of the pain, right. that, which is an emotional bond to it, which is a mental apparition, that's something that you completely conquer. Yeah. And, you know, kind of going through that process, then you're feeling like the way you carry yourself is differently. The back pain is gone. At what point did you attempt to murder the art director, though? I didn't. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's the other thing that happened is that it allowed me to step outside of myself and see, you know what? I'm going to do my job to the best of my ability. Yeah. His decision to keep me or not is his decision. Huh. But I know that I'm the best person for this job. Right. And not only because I know it, but people have told me it and that I've, I've taken the mantle from Francois and created my own character having never seen him it's funny because we even though i'd never seen him do it and still to this day i've never seen him do it we've come to a lot of the same conclusions in the act which is interesting and people tell me that and i'm like oh then i'm doing something right um but it allowed me to realize that you know what i am me and i'm doing the best me that i can do me Mm. and if he doesn't like it fine he doesn't like it i get fired i'll move on he ended up getting let go and moved to a different show Wow. And it's been fantastic ever but since. But even that acceptance, wow. yeah. reaching a place of emotional and psychological acceptance. Yeah. Hey, this is my life. This is this person's job. I authentically am going to do what I do. Yeah. yeah. And every day, is a, every day there's a little bit of acceptance in everything. Hmm. Every single day. Um, 
It's like this morning. Um, I, I had friends who had a baby shower, a Zoom baby shower. <laughs> and uh, I knew I wanted to, I wanted, I love these, I love them dearly. I wanted to be there. I knew I wanted to be here. They overlapped. And I'm like, oh. okay, it's fine. I, they're going to get enough of me. <laughs> they're going to have a hundred, a hundred other people there. They're going to be giving them as much love as I'm going to be giving them. Let's go do this thing with these guys because this is actually I, I, I find talking about not continually talking about it, but talking about things that have happened in my life to be one of the most clarifying moments. Mm. And so I made the decision to come here to clarify my life at this point. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. This moment, everything's clear for me now, and I'm, I'm not confused. And who knows what's going to happen 15 minutes down the road sure. when I'm driving home. But right now, man, I've talked to people. <laughs> mm. I've, I've, I've allowed it to go through my head and come out my mouth and actually make sense to me. So, mm. yeah. That's one good. of the best right. PSAs I've ever heard for talking to a therapist. Yeah, it's just, pretty much. There's a metabolic thing that's happening inside of a human being when they language their truth, mm -hmm. whatever it is, that kind of like organizes it. You know, and puts him to a place where you feel like, yeah, I have homeostasis. I just, and you know, we'll send you a bill. Um, but you know, it's fine. It's fine. I'm glad you decided to come. And you know, I'm sorry that you missed out Did you on. You just call me a homie. <laughs> <laughs> what? But that's sad that you missed out on the baby shower, though. I didn't. I got 15, 20 minutes. Okay, you still got to do that too. Yeah, it that's... was great. Oh man. You know. I got to make the one baby joke I know, which was, <laughs> you know, that all newborns have a soft spot on their forehead uh -huh. right here, and you're really not supposed to touch it. So the best way to remember that is to take a ballpoint pen and <laughs> put a big X across it. That way you know not to touch them. You right don't want to accidentally right. do exactly. anything. Yeah. <laughs> These are good baby jokes. Yeah. <laughs> also, I I'm disappointed you only have one. <laughs> well, like, I have one that I can tell. Tell. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, there's only one baby joke yeah. that you tell to new parents. Exactly. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That, that probably seems yeah. appropriate. <laughs> well, RJ, we're so grateful that you took the time. Man. I'm grateful yeah. for you guys Thank having you. this. I've been wanting yeah. to be on this show since I heard you guys were doing it. Oh, oh Just nice. because not enough people talk. Yeah. Yes. Not enough people talk. And there are people out there going through the same bullshit that every other person is going out. And if they just hear one person talk about it yes. and know that it's okay to talk, it doesn't matter who you talk to. Yeah. yeah. You could talk to yourself. Yes. Yeah. You know, just don't do it in public. Or, or Richard <laughs> but, Branson. Yeah, or Richard Branson. <laughs> um, but it, it, that's why every time I contact somebody from the show, and we're, especially during mm. these times, it's like, if you need anything, I'm here to talk. Mm. Yeah. If you need a shoulder, I'm here for a shoulder, and I've got big ears. Mm. You know? Um because we need to. We need to keep Absolutely. the open lines of communication. This is, if anything, this whole coronavirus thing is making me, the, strengthening the love I have with the people that I love. Mm. Because it, it's, it, it, I can't give them a hug. Right. So I have to tell them in words. Yes. And sometimes it's difficult to say in words, but you can give it a hug. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Right. We lose a whole form of communication. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a I'm a egregiously long hugger anyway. So. <laughs> uh, egregious hugger. Yep. Oh, I actually own a website called um, I own a website called uncomfortablylonghugs.com. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, because it's a uh, it's a pet project of mine that I want to do where I want to create different characters on the strip that just do long hugs. That just and have it filmed from like four cameras <laughs> and just like. To hold a hug just a little too. <laughs> just, and just, and it's, and it's not really filming me. It's filming the reactions of the person I'm hugging. <laughs> like, I have this character that I do. Um, real life character. I was, when I was living in Carmel, this guy, he, um, he would sit on the bench uh, on the main drag, and he would just watch people drive by and wave. And one day I asked him, I said, hey. Uh, I sat down next to him. He's like, hi, how are you? I said, I'm fine. How are you? He waves, and I said, hey, I, I noticed you waved to everybody that drives by. Uh, why? He's like, oh, I just like sitting here making people happy. Oh. <laughs> so that's my – and then I took him to breakfast. We went to McDonald's, and oh. um, he asked if they had crab <laughs> <laughs> because he couldn't eat ham in uh -huh. the morning. Uh-huh. I think the McRib is coming back. I don't know if they're going to do the That's another thing I'm going to miss. The McCrab. <laughs> the McCrab. <laughs> Huge opportunity yeah. missed. McDonald's. But that, no, they've done that. They've done the McCrab? Uh, it was a McCrab or some kind of fake lobster. Oh, McCrab. They did a fake thing. lobster. The, yeah, yeah, they yeah. did that already. Wow. That's, these, yeah. These are the, yeah. So, inspiring. McDonald's to... serves a fake. A fake <laughs> lobster. <laughs> <laughs>
Do you see a golden arch is at the side of the road that says, <laughs> We've served billions of fake lobster. <laughs> we serve fake lobster. So anyway, uh, on that note, uh, grateful that you came in, man. Yeah, I love you. what you shared. I love that you were willing to do it. And I love that message at the end, which is just telling all the listeners, talking about it is healthy, no matter who it's to, in any format. And don't, you know what? Get a fucking therapist. <laughs> hey, there you go. I'm sorry. I don't care who you are. You're, <laughs> I mean, I have a therapist. Hey, mm-hmm. good. I love dearly and get to talk to once oh, a week. Good. And we've been doing it by phone. Wow, we buried now. the lead. We didn't even ask about that. <laughs> do yourself a favor. Wow. Just do yourself a favor. Yeah, your friends can be your therapist, but come on. Your friends really don't want to listen to all your bullshit. <laughs> Jacob does. <laughs> Call and Jacob. Your, and your friends are assholes. Yeah, Audio your friends guy are Jacob. <laughs> Audio guy Jacobs at, po- Audio guy Jacob at podtherapy.com. <laughs> I'll, I'll listen to your problems, but it's not cheap. Yep. <laughs> and you don't pay him to listen to your problems. You pay him to not comment. That's yeah. right. Yeah, 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 you're paying for his silence. That's yes. a different level. Yeah, yeah, that's what you. It's a whole other Patreon level. We're gonna, now that would be Matreon level. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there's always mommy issues. How uh, how long have you been uh, visiting with a therapist regularly? Twenty four years. Wow. wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. Now I imagine over that time, different therapists. Yes. Yeah. Um, up until the age of. 34, it was one therapist. Oh, wow. Um, older guy mm-hmm. uh, who just, he, he uh, wanted to get out of the business, mm-hmm. referred me to one of his partners in his office um, who was kind of like that. <laughs> it's amazing how you guys are all so different. He was kind of like that military drill sergeant uh, athletic trainer at the gym, oh, kind of therapist. Okay, <laughs> his approach was not not. He, he was very mo- much more proactive. In, right. in, in, yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, you know who he was like. You guys watched um, Afterlife two season two yet? No, no. I haven't. No, not yet. There's a therapist on Afterlife. Okay. You guys have to watch it. I will check that I'm out. Not even gonna spoil I always it love the cinematic this. depictions of our profession. This guy, <laughs> the, Jim, hasn't even watched Silence of the Lambs. He's uh, not going to watch Afterlife. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and then uh, finally found a wonderful woman that, um, and don't be afraid of choosing an opposite gender. Yes, it's, 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 right. Because a lot of times I found, that, especially with her, that she had an insight that I didn't have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when I was in my running through my selfish phase, and there was a, a good year, year and a half, two years that I was look out for numero uno, fuck y'all, mm-hmm. you know. Oh. And she was able to point things out to me um, that she noticed, and that I, she noticed I'd like to talk about. Mm. And she's like, "Well, how are we going to let's address this?" Mm. And then when I got here, I don't have a, a local therapist here, but I have a therapist that we talk on the phone once yeah. a week. Which has turned out great for Corona. That's awesome. Yeah, and <laughs> no interruption. They've been my therapist for what, fifteen years now. Oh wow, that's no, no, fantastic. Sorry, Thirteen years. Wow, wow man. that's yeah. great. What a great PSA. Yeah, yeah and I then didn't think I mean, when you, and also when you're meeting with the same therapist for a long time, they can do stuff like that where they can point out patterns, you know, because they've Absolutely. been with you long enough for like, yeah, you seem to focus on this a lot, you know. Yeah. Yeah. She's the one. She's the one who also taught me about the cycle of sevens. Oh yeah, that. <laughs> she's like, you know what? You did this seven years ago. Seven years ago. And you also did this seven years ago. <laughs> That's interesting. And I'm like, well, you know, Stop. <laughs> all the important stuff in my life has happened in the seventh year. Like uh-huh. I got the job with Cirque when I was 42. Oh, wow. You know, I almost died when I was 49. Yeah, okay, shit. <laughs> yeah. What's going on here? Wow. <laughs> Heightens the awareness. It does. I tell you what, that's one of the most gratifying things I've ever had professionally is whenever you have a really long-term relationship that you get to work with somebody, the the amount of things you have access to is so much different. And you get to be with them during the ups and downs of their life. You meet them in one phase of their life. You watch them navigate through other phases. Whenever I've gotten to work with somebody for a year, two years, three years, and even if you're not seeing them every week, you know, but you're maintaining the, the rapport. Oh, my God, the insights. Because sometimes they'll say something and be like, hey, I remember you saying this right. 18 months ago. <laughs> They're like, oh, did I? Yeah. And then you did this stupid thing. It's funny. <laughs> you I, know, I, maybe I, you shouldn't I, do that. I had our last call on Tuesday of this week. And for the first time ever, I said, hey, uh, Alyssa, um, 
you know, if if you need to talk to anybody, I'm here for you. Oh. If you want to give me a call, let me know. I'll give you the friend ring. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> No. no, no. We have our own therapist. <laughs> yeah. Therapists have therapists. Well, RJ, it's just been an honor, man. Yeah, thank so you this, very much. This turned out to be one of the best random things I've gotten us into. See, look, I'll come I back know. if you guys want me to. Trust I'm, my I'm, instinct. I'm, I'm, Hell yeah, I'm, I'll answer anything. I mean, yeah, there's man. so much more shit we can talk about. <laughs> well, let's plug some of we the stuff. We should do an that RJ part two. Tell us about. You said you got a podcast that's in the works. I'm up to fucking nothing. I'm in quarantine. What the hell is <laughs> wrong with you? Have you not been listening to? Where's anything? the live stream where we and can watch you do your leather work? And I picked the wrong time to. Stop masturbating. <laughs> and I stopped sniffing glue. Oh. <laughs> I've got nothing going on. So I'm currently working on a podcast um, called A Man of Certain Size. Yeah. And it's my journey to and through bariatric surgery. That's going to be great. Um, I've recorded four, three um, episodes of it. Um, my problem is, Jesus, are we am I, am I too quiet for you? What's going on over there, Loudy? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've recorded three episodes of it, and I just I'm a I'm a horrible editor because I hate editing myself because I think that everything I say needs to be heard, but it doesn't. Um, so those will come out probably in the next couple of weeks. Wow, it's yeah. exciting! Man of yeah. a certain size. Man of a certain size. That's going to okay. be great. And there's also men of a certain size, which is a c- counterpart where I'm going to start uh, kind of interviewing. Yeah, checking in with other people yep. that are working through. Oh, that's and it's awesome. not just men, but it's man. It's because it's of me. But I'm, sure. right. I'm going to be. Inter- My doctor actually said that he would uh, do an interview with me. Oh, oh wow. cool! So I'm like, cool, sweet. Let's do that. This is great. Yeah. And I got to tell you, we've had so many questions over the years that are related to this. This is why we pared back a lot of what you were saying. Two other things we've heard. Yeah. And you know, this is something that I know so many people would like to understand better, to have somebody to relate to, to watch somebody go through that process, to hear it live. Yeah. You know, just like your friend telling you, "Hey, two chicken wings," and it was like. Okay, that's intimidating, but thank you. That's yeah, real absolutely. life data. I need that data. I mean, it's like when my when they tell me that because I'm a huge water drinker. Right? I'm being a fat guy living in Vegas. You've got to stay hydrated. I mean, anybody living in Vegas got to stay hydrated. hydrated I, yeah. And I find because I was getting the headaches, getting the joint pain, all that mm-hmm. stuff, and also I'm a sweater. I sweat like a motherfucking pig. Yeah, so water helps. And, well, I'm finding out now that you know I, I can't drink when I eat. Uh huh. If I do want to have it, I have to have it an hour before the meal. That's right, yeah. I can't use straws anymore. Oh, that's right. Can't no have straws. carbonated beverages. No carbs. Yeah, Ugh. no carbonated beverages. Oh, wow. And so I'm just like, oh, my God. I'm so, and she's, and this just this last week, she's like, so how's your water intake going? And I laughed. Because <laughs> <coughs> I have one of those um, Hydro Flasks, the big 88-ounce uh, yeah. ones. Uh-huh. And I drink five or six of those a day. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. I drink a lot That's of water. That's a lot of water. Yeah. She goes, uh, how's the water going? I said, I, <laughs> I, I'm i still drinking the same amount. She goes, oh. And you still have a straw in the hole? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, all right, this week I need you to actively work on sipping water. Wow. Pouring it from your big thing into Jeez. an eight-ounce glass. Behavior modification. And sip it. Jeez. Yeah. Yep. And then she said, how's your food going? I said, well, I know that I've lost weight, even though I'm not, it doesn't matter if I just can't lose, I can't gain weight, mm-hmm. but it doesn't matter if I lose weight. I said, I know I've lost weight because of the self-imposed diet because I can't keep my underwear up. Okay. Oh. And she's like, that's great. She said, F- chewing your food, your solid meal, how's uh, that going? Went, yeah. It's going great. She goes, so you're, every bite, you're looking at it, contemplating it, um, seeing everything about it, and then chewing it 40 times. 40 like, times. Yep. No. Definitely right. not doing that. No. She's like, well, you need to start doing that now. Yep. Yep. Because These are it, all real life meals, meals are the long haul with food. Um, the slower you eat, the slower you get full. And because you're not eating a fuck ton of food, right. you're going to get full in three bites. So you might as yeah. well make that three bites last 10, 15 minutes. It's a know? mindfulness meditation technique. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but even forty yep. bites. I mean, you got to sit there and chew something That's over exactly and over. Exactly, mindfulness. Yep. Yeah, it's amazing. So this is going to be great. And then if people want to follow you out in social media, uh, you have an interesting uh, <laughs> tag in in Twitter, um, which now makes me think, oh, acid. <laughs> yeah, it shouldn't. It should make you think mushrooms, but that's okay. <laughs> on Twitter, it's Magic Fun Guy M A G I C F U N G I because I love the psychotropics. <laughs> And he's a magical fun guy. Exactly. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> on the Facebook, it's RJ Owens. On the Instagram, I believe it's also Magic Fun Guy. Um, on OnlyFans, it's uh, OnlyFans. Sh- <laughs> it's Wet Shaped Pussy. <laughs> if, 
if you're interested. <laughs> it's just videos of RJ shaving cats. Exactly. <laughs> While on shrooms. <laughs> there, it all comes full circle. Well, man, That's we great. just are so grateful that you yeah, joined us today. Thank you very much. I thank you for having me. Awesome. I really appreciate it. Yeah, awesome we will definitely have, have you back. Yeah, the best part I'm glad that you're willing to do Anytime. it. Anytime. The best yeah. part of this whole interview has been listening to Jim just repeatedly say the word shrooms. Shrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot today. He's got the lingo down. <laughs> so if I just go bite random cactuses. You want to get high? <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I'm holding Caulfield. Oh, Jesus. All right. Um, end of the show notes. Anything we need to announce to anybody? Uh, no. I think. Uh, if we had any new Therapals or anybody join, we apologize. We're recording this about two, two weeks, weeks in advance. So. Yep. We don't know about it yet. Yep. But so thank you. And thank you for joining his wife on Mother's Day. Yeah, we yeah. got Mother's Day stuff coming up. And for all of you that have uh, left our show after the last episode, baby, come back. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, sorry. I'm sorry. We brought in RJ. That was nice. Yeah. There's, there's things about this like you the, like. It's like the, we went from like the worst episode we've ever done yeah. to the best. To the like, best. See? Literally 15 minutes. We have a very, di- <laughs> yeah, this is a very toxic relationship people yeah. have with our podcast. Well, we definitely want to also thank our bosses, uh, the Elite Eight, the mysterious and shrouded Illuminati members of our fan club, the Third Producers. Thank you, Smitty Scoop, who apparently lives in Virginia. Jake Schneider, who's in Georgia. Robert Brownie Jr. Mint. Oh, I can do this, actually. He's in Indiana. Yes. Okay. Uh, Kayla Lansbury. Mm. Hmm. She seems like Florida. I'm giving her Florida. Okay. Yeah. You can live in Florida. Wyoming. Oh, we were close. Lansbury. Ellie O'Dare. New England. <laughs> Ellie Lansbury. Lansbury. Yeah. I hardly know her. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie's everywhere. Ellie drives from A she's, to B. No, she's uh, San Jose now. Oh, she, that's right. Yeah, currently hold up in San Jose. Judy Schneider, who's also in Georgia. Nathan's hot dog scoop, probably in Oregon. Dr. Ben <laughs> Don, currently serving 5 to 10 in uh, Raleigh County Jail. And ex officio board member, Crazy Banana Scoop. I don't know where Crazy's at, but I'm sure on Earth. And if you'd like to hear this episode uncut and unedited and enjoy our spontaneous side projects, go to patreon.com slash therapy and thank you for supporting mental health. That's all the time that we've got for this week's session. We want to thank our landlords, the Ice Cream Social Podcast, and thanks to those of you who contributed to our show today. We really appreciate it. Remember, pod therapy is something you should keep all to yourself. Share this episode with someone who needs it by opening this episode's description in your podcast app and copying and pasting that link we provided into your social media. Don't forget, you can find us at facebook.com slash podtherapy, on Twitter at podtherapyguys, and at patreon.com slash therapy. If you want to submit a question to the show, ask anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. I'm Nick Tangeman. I'm Richard Branson. Thanks, and we'll see if your appointment next week. <laughs> Richard Branson. No, no. Spirit guy. Not Richard Brant. Wait, was it Richard Charles Branson? Bronson. Charles Bronson. <laughs> Is that not the same guy? You. <laughs> wait, wait. Which, guy, which one of these guys was in Greece? Charles, <laughs> Charles Bronson.